Hey everybody, it's Marissa from Alliance for a Better Minnesota, and we are here live with Representative Erin May Quaid, and uh, we're here because the legislative session, the Minnesota legislative session, begins tomorrow. So we wanted to give you all a chance to ask your questions about how you can be more involved, questions that you have for the representative before the session starts tomorrow. So thanks for joining us. We're really excited to have you all tuning in today, this morning. Um, and welcome, Representative. Thanks and for having why me. Why don't you just introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Representative Erin May Quaid. I represent 57A, which is Apple Valley in the northeast portion of Lakeville. I'm a first term representative. I was elected in 2016. I was the only person to flip a seat from red to blue in the state house. And I represent the community I was born and raised in. I'm really honored to do that. And I'm excited to be here with you today. And one big question that we, we all are wondering is, what made you decide to run for office? Yeah. Do you want me to tell you or do you want me to tell them? <laughs> do you want me to look at the camera? Yes. Yeah. Tell everyone. Uh, well, I worked for Congressman Keith Ellison before being elected, and I brought him to a visit to the Sheridan Story, which is a nonprofit that pairs local churches and businesses with students and schools that are facing significant um, hunger. So if they have the weekend hunger gap, if they don't have access to food between Friday and Monday. And at that visit, I noticed on the wall that they were serving in my schools, the schools that I went to, Greenlee, Falcon, and Eastview. And I didn't know that childhood hunger was such a big issue that they were having to go into schools to put meals in backpacks. So after the visit, I was riding with Congressman Keith Ellison and I was ranting about how I was going to call my church and we're going to pair up with my elementary school. And he asked me, uh, when was I going to run for office to change the systems that don't allow parents to both pay rent and feed their kids? And I said, well, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to run for office. I'm more of a behind the scenes kind of gal. And he said, what are you waiting for? And I didn't really have an answer for him. It wasn't more policy experience. It wasn't more passion for my community. It wasn't more passion for um, policy in community. So I really didn't have an answer. So then I just said, you know what? I think we're going to run for office. Awesome. Yeah. And I think that's a good kind of segue lead into one of the one of the great questions we got from our audience here is, what can people do to encourage and support more young people to run for office? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the first is that we have to support young people in general because if we don't support young people in the spaces that they're already in, so they're on boards, they're on councils, they have their own you know, student representative government, if we don't tokenize them, if we actually listen to their input, not just ask for it and then say, great, thanks, sit down, uh, that would encourage them to step up into politics as well. That's how they know that we would support them when they step up to run for office. Uh, the second, I think the automatic voter registration and allowing young folks to register, pre-register to vote so they can be registered when they turn 18 is huge. If we're asking people, young people, to step up and run for office, that's a really big step into democracy. So that first level, voting, uh, we have to get over that one first too. So I think those are some ways that we can support young people. And then the last one is always going to be money. Uh, millennials and the generations behind us don't have wealth like the generations before us do. So it's always going to be a struggle for us to raise the kind of money that's needed, unfortunately, to run for office. I know for me, I have to work really hard to raise a few hundred dollars and some of my colleagues can call a friend and get a few thousand in a few minutes. So that's always helpful too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we got a lot of lot of really great questions from everybody out there. Thank you so much for submitting your questions for the representative. Um, some fun ones too, not just the serious stuff. I like fun. What is your favorite thing about Minnesota? Uh, I, you know, I really love that Minnesota feels kind of like a, a big, small town. Like there's always two degrees of separation between everybody. So I met uh, one of my legislative fellows, Bowen, is from Alabama. And we were talking the other day and I was telling him about this wonderful couple that I went to high school with who are amazing singers and actors. And he knows them because he acts with them. And it's just so random. I mean, he, Bowen isn't from Minnesota. He's from Alabama. But we both know some of the same people. So I love the way that that feels. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so jumping back into more of the, po more of the politics, mm -hmm. what is one of the most important things that people should know about this year's legislative session? Wow, that's a really, okay, so this year's legislative session is going to be really interesting. Um, there's a few details that we're still working out that are left over from last session. I think the most important thing that you can know is that you can call your representative, email your representative, come to the state capitol and testify on bills and any bill 
because that's what it's for. This is the people's house. It's for, of, by the people. That's what our democracy is. So you can participate in any way that's comfortable to you. Um, the other thing that I would want you to know is that you don't have to know everything about a subject to say something about it. Minnesotans are policy experts by the very fact that they live the policies that are enacted in our state every single day. Just because you don't know the bill number or the appropriation dollar amount or the bill author, it doesn't mean you don't deeply understand how policies affect your life. Those are the stories that are really important at the legislature. And so it sounds like there's a lot of ways that people can get a hold of their representatives. Yeah. That can be pretty intimidating sometimes, yeah. trying to figure out the best way to do that. What, what would you say is the best way for people to get in contact with their representative? Yeah, so I get this question a lot, and because I worked for a member of Congress, I always start at the federal level because it's a little bit different, and then I work my way down. So for a member of Congress or a senator, I always encourage folks to call their offices. The staff at the other end of the line that answer that phone are real people. I was one of those staff people at one point in time. And so when we're sitting with our member later and they ask, you know, what's going on? What are people calling about? I have really real stories to tell, to tell that member of Congress. Um, and since we're people, we're moved by those stories too. Um, and they're not going to challenge you. They're not going to say, oh, you know, give me really specific things about this bill that you have an opinion on. But calling is really helpful. Uh, for locally elected officials, we represent fewer people, and so we tend to check our own email um, and respond to our own email. So emailing is always really good. Calling can be good, too. Um, showing up, you can never underestimate the power of showing up and having a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and then, you know, for your school board, your mayors, your city councils, I would go there because they're going to be right in your city or in, around where you are. I would attend some of those meetings. And then don't forget your county commissioner, that invisible layer of government. They are in charge of taking care of the oldest, youngest, and most vulnerable Minnesotans, and they have a lot of money to do so. So make sure you get in contact in some way with your, your county commissioner. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so we, we got some some broader questions like that. We got some specific questions too. It seems like people are really paying attention to some of the, yeah. the bigger things that have been happening in the last year. Yeah. Um, one specifically that is related to the issue of sexual assault, which has been yeah. huge nationally and in Minnesota, um, is how can people help to make the sexual assault task force mm. a reality? A reality? That's really important. Yeah, um, I'll be very candid. I am incredibly frustrated that the sexual assault task force hasn't been assembled. I honestly don't know what the holdup is. It's something that we asked for, my God, I think it's almost 100 days now. Um, Lindsay Port, Representative Becker Finn, and I have asked for this. Continue to call your legislators, but uh, the speaker, Kurt Dowd, the Senate Majority Leader, Paul Gazelka, uh, Tom Bach, who is the minority leader in the Senate, and then uh, Representative Melissa Hortman, who is the minority leader in the House. Um, I want to give big props to Melissa because she has been really working on this behind the scenes and trying to get her male colleagues to get on board. But this task force is really important because it gives it would allow an outside look into what's happening at the legislature to, to solve this issue of sexual harassment. And it's, very, it's so pervasive. I don't think that us looking at our own policies is going to solve it because that's exactly how we got where we are. So make a lot of noise, call your folks, call the leaders, and demand that this happens because I still am demanding that it happens. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so folks also want to know, that's like, I would say that's a pretty bipartisan issue. That's something that needs to be solved, that we need to all be working together to fix Yes, that. yes. Um, what's, what, do you, what would you say is the greatest opportunity for bipartisan cooperation this session and the biggest issue that would require a progressive fight? Yeah, okay, two so two, yeah, so the first one is So what's the bipartisan. greatest opportunity for bipartisan, bipartisan cooperation this session, would you say? Um, our bonding bill. So the bonding bill, so we operate on a two-year cycle, the legislature does. The first year of that cycle, which was last year, was a budget year. And the second year of that cycle is a bonding year. That's this year. And bonding is essentially borrowing. It's why you see all the infrastructure upgrades. They're updating Apple Valley Middle School and High School right now. Um, so the bonding bill originates in the House, and it must pass with three-fifths majority in both chambers in order to pass. So there must be Democrats and Republicans that both, both vote for the bill in order for it to pass. So great opportunity for bipartisan work together, a great opportunity to make sure that people in every community in Minnesota have uh, work that's going in, investments that are going in into their community. So that's really good. Uh, second part of that question? So the second part of that question is, what's the biggest issue that will require more of a progressive fight, like one, one of the largest hurdles in tackling progressive issues? 
Um, so one of the biggest issues that we'll be seeing this year, a, big, a tax on reproductive choice. Um, there's been a bill introduced that's an abortion ban. Um, that's horrifying. So that'll be one. Um, I have a feeling that we'll see some of the issues from last session come back. So the anti-protester bill, I imagine, might come back. Um, I was thinking we might see some really bad gun bills this year. I don't know if that's still going to be the case, but I, I you know, I would imagine that might come up again as well. There's um, some of those going on. And I think one of the biggest issues that we have tackling progressive issues is that so often we say, okay, we know we're correct about the solution, and so we get really, really detailed and policy wonky about explaining what the solution is that we're proposing instead of telling the stories of the people that we're aiming to lift up. And I think on the other side of the aisle, they do a great job of just telling the stories, but not really mentioning the policies because the policies don't help that much. But people feel reflected in hearing their stories. They don't feel reflected when people detail policy. And I know why we do that. It's because we're right. We're, we're correct. Um, but I think the more that we can tell stories and explain how our policies are going to lift up people specifically through those stories uh, will help help it resonate more deeply, I think. Mm -hmm. The Minnesota Care buy-in, I think, is the one that comes to mind. We spent hours on the floor like detailing exactly how much money it, it would cost and how much money the Republican proposal costs. So it's $100,000 to a $1 billion. Um, Minnesota Care buy-in would have allowed any Minnesotan without access to health insurance for whatever reason to pay their own way in a system that's already set up. I didn't really understand it until my mom told me like, oh, this would help me because she retired um, early at 63 and she had two years to go before she could get Medicare and her premiums were $800 a month. Minnesota Care buy-in, I think they would have been like 300. So that was a story that really helped me understand the policy. I wish we could have told it that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it helpful for people to, when they are contact the, contacting the representatives, to share those stories too with them, like to share Absolutely. how they're impacted? Absolutely. Um, you know, form letters and, and postcards and petitions, they're good. It, it lets us know how many people in our districts uh, feel a certain way about an issue. But a personal email or a letter or a story, it really hits that home. I've had people reach out with deeply personal things about their lives and, and explain how a policy or explain that they need a policy to, um, to fix that. And so stories really help me understand the intricacies and also you know, the law is made by a bunch of folks at the legislature. We can't account for every single variation of people's lives. And so often I will hear from folks and they'll tell me how a policy that was meant to help them actually didn't really go far enough or it didn't help quite how we thought it was going to. And so hearing how maybe we haven't gotten their law quite right is really helpful as well. Great. Yeah. So we also want to know a little bit more about you. Okay. As a person. Yeah. Um, so when you were a kid what did you want to be when you grew up a singer i wanted to be young well i guess this doesn't make sense but i was a kid i wanted to be the young nala on broadway um i i love to sing and so I, I wanted to be a singer yeah do you wanna do you wanna do any performance right now or no thank you okay okay didn't know if maybe you wanted to just give us a little some runs some vocal runs some vocal yeah vocal exercises yeah <laughs> um and what did what did you get voted in high school I was voted most likely to host their own talk show. Yeah. Well, you're, you're kind of making your there, way yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Like here right now. That's pretty good. I always felt like it would be like a Rachel Maddow meets Oprah with really good hair. That was, <laughs> yeah, the idea. I love yeah. that. I love that idea. Um, so another great question that we got from our audience out here is, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face as a queer woman of color in politics? Oh, yeah. Um, I, th you know, this may be obvious to a lot of people, but maybe not to others. It's, there are people who automatically do not like me because of who I love and how I look. And it makes it really tough because they have completely cut out the option of working with me before we even got to the table. And that's really tough. I always have to be aware of that. And that's something that my, a lot of my colleagues don't ever have to deal with or probably even think about. But that is, that's really tough. It takes a group of people away from the table with me just because of how I look or who I love yeah um, so yeah there's like a lot of different types of folks in different communities that have different sets of issues that they're mm -hmm. working and trying mm -hmm. to organize around um, specifically trying to you know overcome oppression or mm -hmm. you know create more opportunity in their communities yeah. 
how do we organize communities around specific issues and address them ourselves? Yeah. Um, so I've worked in a bunch of different types of politics. I've worked in issue-based campaigning. I've worked in uh, party campaigning, and then I've worked in uh, candidate campaigning. And of all of those, issue-based campaigning and organizing is it's not the easiest, but it's the easiest to do because it brings people around one specific issue. They don't have to agree with every policy that a candidate has put forth or every policy or idea that a party has put forth. I've seen this re work really well with Moms Demand Action in Every Town for Gun Safety. I've seen it work really well um, for fully funding our schools and the parents' action committees for the, from the school boards. So the best ways to organize in your local community is one, know that you don't have to wait for permission to do this organizing. So often I think someone is waiting for um, something to join or something to, for someone to say, you should do this. I'll tell you right now, you should do this. You should be the leader. You should step up and just start gathering your folks, meet in a living room and figure out what is the issue and what do you want to do about it and who do you need to convince to, to help you with that. Um, a lot of times people are working on issues the same issue but separately and might not know about each other so look for opportunities to partner with other organizations other groups who might be working on the same issue or an issue that aligns with your values um, and then ask an organizer i'm here my wife elise is an organizer she's an amazing organizer so reach out to anyone you know who has any experience in it and ask them to walk you through it i have done uh, that three times in the last week i walked someone who has never reached out to their legislator before, reached out to me and said, I wanna do a lobby day. And I was like, great, I'll help you. And just listing out all the steps that would be really helpful for a lobby day. So use, use your resources, I would love to be one for you. Yeah. Great. So what about if, um, what if someone is thinking about running for office? What if that's kind of like mm -hmm. what they feel is the step that they need to be taking to do something and be making a difference in their community? What would be like the biggest piece of advice that you would give to somebody who's considering running, running for office? For office? Um, if you are considering running for office, know that you don't have to wait. You are great exactly how you are right now. There is not one type of person that can be a politician. Many different kinds of people can be politicians and elected officials. So often we only have one or two types of folks that are politicians. Um, so don't wait if you're ready now. Um, get a good team around you, people that bring things to the table that you might not have. So I know that I am idea and fire and I'm ready to go all the time. So my team, like I'm a lot of gas. So my team is a lot of like, okay, and how are we going to get to that thing that you wanna do? And they really help me get through the, this intricate step-by-step -step detail. So make sure you have a good team around, that, around you that you trust. And know yourself well enough to know what you can and can't do. So I am not a morning person, I know that. I don't schedule things at seven in the morning because I will be a mess. I also know I'm an introvert, so I schedule time in my schedule to be alone so that I don't blow up my schedule later on to get that alone time. So know yourself while, before you go into this because being elected or even running for office, it highlights you. It doesn't change you. It really amplifies who you are. And so you'll want to know yourself well enough to know what is going to get amplified when I start running for office. Yeah. Was that helpful? Yeah. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. I, mean, I feel like it was. Good. Um, so some more fun questions we got from folks. What is the most Minnesotan thing about you? Uh, I mean, I do say oofta a lot, but I think uh, I have a, I don't know if you can see it, my Minnesota tattoo here. It's pretty Minnesotan, I think. And I married, you know, a farm girl. And my mom was raised on the Iron Range and my dad went to the U. So it's kind of like a little Minnesota love story there. Yeah. Cute. Yeah. Um, what do you do for fun on the weekends? Play with our dog, Soda. That's, yes, probably very Minnesotan of me as well, S-O-T-A. Um, my wife and I cook a lot. We really enjoy cooking. Um, I enjoy stand-up comedy, so I like to watch stand-up comedy either at home or go to see, you know, amateur open mic nights. And I read a lot. I read a lot. Yeah. Awesome. Um, S-O-T-A. So did you name your dog after Minnesota? Yes. Yes, we did. We have a lot of Minnesota memorabilia, like, all over the house. Our shower curtain says home on it, but the O is in Minnesota. Uh, we have the Minnesota signs all over our, our house, and uh, my wife has the tattoo as well. It's, we really love this state a lot, yeah. Love it, yeah. that's great. Um, which book from your childhood was most influential on your life? Ooh, 
I guess you could just say your favorite book. Well, I well maybe, maybe that might be two different things though. That might be two different things. I'll, I'll tell you the book Corduroy, that book about the bear. I loved that book so much because it was it was the first time I'd seen a young black character in a book that had nothing to do with like civil rights or you know so you know something that was more like and here's how you can overcome this struggle. It was just this little girl who wanted a bear, and I thought it was so sweet. I kept that book for much longer. Then I probably should have had it. But there's also a book called The Devil's Arithmetic that I read when I was young. Um, and it was about a young girl who, like, ends up, she's, you know, current day, but it was in the 80s, ends up back in time in, in the Holocaust. And it was the first time I'd ever read anything about the Holocaust. I didn't know a lot about it. I was really young. I was, like, nine. Um, and so after reading it, I asked my parents, and they sat me down to explain that, yes, the Holocaust was a long time ago, but anti-Semitism is still here. And they kind of walked me through, here's ways that you can see that. So that was like mind blowing. I didn't, I didn't know anything about anti-Semitism up to that point. And so that was, that was life changing, definitely. Yeah. The power of books. Yes. Um, so you kind of touched on this already a little bit in kind of your response to what actually made you decide to run for office. But what are some more of the issues that you would say you're most passionate about? Yes, yeah, so childhood hunger is always going to be a big one. There are 200,000 food insecure or hungry students or children in Minnesota. That can't be a silent issue. Hungry kids should not be a thing that happens in our state. Um, I'm really passionate about disability rights. I have I've tried to spend as much time in my community with uh, folks with disabilities and or the people who provide services for them and or their loved ones. And what I've seen so often is that in addition to trying to be their own advocates and also trying to lead the most independent lives they can, um, they don't have a lot of time to organize or get to the Capitol, and yet they do most often, and I love that. But they're often the first people left out of the conversation. They're often the first people that are just cut out um, from our solutions. And I, I, it pains me to know that an entire group of Minnesotans are being left behind simply because what it feels like is because they don't have political power. Um, so I'm really, really passionate about that, and I, I work a lot in my community on that. I love our schools. I love public school teachers. I love public school students. I love our schools. I was educated in the schools I represent. Fully funding them is a really big, uh, very important issue to me. Equity continues to be a huge deal. We have the highest racial disparities in this region of the state, or the second highest um, in the nation. And we can do something about that because we know that if some Minnesotans can do well, then we can do work to make sure all Minnesotans do well. Civil liberties will continue to be a big issue for me. Your internet service provider should not be able to sell your data. Um, so we got to do something about that. And then I, I want to be a proactive legislator, not a reactive legislator. So looking ahead, some of the issues, crises I see with a lot of folks that are going to be retiring, I worry about are folks able, able to age in place? Are they dealing with isolation or loneliness, which is awful? Um, are they able to get to the doctor? Are they able to make sure they're still having groceries? Um, and then are we having a workforce that's replacing them? So those are some of the big issues that come to mind right away. There's probably a million more. I have five that I ran on, so safe and healthy communities, which includes gun violence prevention, protecting women's health and choice, reproductive justice is very important, equal opportunity to the Minnesota dream, as I call it, so economic opportunity and prosperity, and a, uh, accessible and accountable democracy. I call myself an apostle of democracy, means a champion and visionary of. I am a champion and visionary of our democracy. It is very much under threat, and I love it enough to fight for it and continue to uh, defend it. So those are, those are some of my issues. Great. Just a few. Just a few. Just a few. Um, well, one of our viewers has has an uh, issue that a lot of people, I would say, parents especially, yeah. um, are super concerned about. He's He says, daycare costs more than my yes. mortgage. What can be done to address the high cost of quality daycare? Yes. My goodness. Um, and I apologize for missing that because I hear it so often, but I don't have kids, and so sometimes I forget how expensive it is. Um, you know, I was driving the other night, and I was thinking, wouldn't it make sense to, like, if the cost of daycare was at or more than what you would make for a job, then people wouldn't work. And then we're keeping people out of the workforce because of the cost of daycare. One of the things I know we could do is um, universal pre-K. That's at least a year earlier that kids are getting into school. Um, education is not daycare, but it's a year earlier that parents could not have to have their kids in um, 
in daycare. And then there was a task force that was put together for chi for just increasing child care assistance. And so I would say that the fiscal cliff that happens, so the people who qualify for child care assistance, um, it's probably not high enough because if the cost of daycare for you know two kids, I think is something like $36,000 a year. I didn't make 36,000, exactly. It is so much money. That's more than a lot of people make. And so I think we could raise that cap on, on how much, um, folks can make in order to get child care assistance. I think that would just be one of the, the first solutions I would. And then access to, because in different parts of the state, there aren't even child care providers. And so looking at how can we support child care providers in, in other parts of the state where they might not actually have a provider. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so we're going to transition over to another fun question we got. What's your favorite state fair food or foods? Ooh, yes. Um, red wine slushies and cheese curds. I really love cheese curds. Cheese curds, classic. Oh, and the mini donuts. That we, would be one of my favorites, I would say. We did a food tour. Shout out to Lindsay and Steve Port for putting it together. They like had a list and a map. I made it through, I think, 10 of the 18. And I think they had to be rolled out of the state fair after they made it to all 18. But it was, that was a bomb uh, state fair trip, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I experienced my first state fair last year. And Your first? Yes, and I loved it. It was great. Okay, quick story. My father and, well, my father in particular, my mom didn't love to walk at the state fair, but my dad would bring my brother and I every year, and we'd get up super, super early and be there right when it would open, and we would stay all the way through until the fireworks. Every year. Like, I, I think I've only missed it three times, and it was for campaigns. Thanks, Obama. It was one. Yeah, that was the first one I ever missed, was for the Obama campaign. Yeah. That's cute. Um, so there's uh, some folks who I think have been joining as we've been talking, maybe with some of the initial questions. Okay. So I kind of want to circle and do some of those like bigger questions um, reframed a little bit that we did at the beginning. Sure. But, um, for you know everyone who's just tuning in, um, how can Minnesotans make a difference at the state capitol? Because you know I think you've explained this before. People feel like they have to be an expert or they have mm -hmm. to know how everything works to be able to do anything and kind of feel helpless sometimes. Yep. So what can what can people be doing? Yeah, so I, I wanna repeat this again, because even if everybody already heard it, I'll say it again. You don't have to know everything to say something about a policy, a bill, an idea. I want everyone to know that they are already policy experts because they live the policies that the legislature enacts every single day of their lives. They understand how their lives are. And because you are that policy expert, even if you don't know the bill number or the appropriation dollar amount or the bill author, it doesn't mean that your story isn't important. It's incredibly important. So reach out to your legislator, write them an email, give them a phone call, but it's really important to show up. Face-to-face -face conversations are the best ways that we can, I mean, talk to each other, right, but change hearts and minds. So if, especially if you're talking to a legislator that doesn't really align with you politically. Um, all bills that are heard in committee are open to public comment and testimony. So if you see a bill that comes up and you say to yourself, uh-uh, I don't like that, or ooh, I love that, head on down to the Capitol and you can testify on that bill. Um, that's a really great way to get involved. And you know, there are lobby days that happen pretty much every day during the legislative session. So if you have a local organization that you're part of, whether it's a union or let's say you're an optometrist or a nurse or an educator or I'm thinking of all the ones that we have, or if there's an issue that's really important to you, chances are there is a lobby day at the Capitol. Check out whatever organization that you would do that through or the union you're part of and join your lobby day. It's really important. They'll make the appointment with your legislator for you and then you just have to tell your story. Great. And um, we were talking about this a little bit before, but what are some of the, can you talk about what the specific committees are that you're a part of? Yeah. And kind of what, um, what issues that those committees focus mm -hmm. on, just so people have an idea of where you're, where you're at, and you yeah. know, what to expect from, yeah. from that in the session. Yeah. So I am on the Veterans Committee, which is another issue I'm really, really passionate about. I think um, I had a few constituents at my town hall on Saturday say that they don't feel like we're doing enough to support veterans, and I think people who have stepped up to serve our country, whether they were deployed overseas or here. Um, deserve all the support that we can provide them. So if they don't feel like they're being supported, that's a message we really have to hear. 
Um, I'm on the Education Policy Committee. So some committees or some issue areas have a policy committee and a finance committee that are separate. The policy committee says what, finance committee says how much money we're going to do for it. I'm on the Education Policy Committee. And then I'm on the Job Growth and Energy Affordability Policy and Finance Committee, which is a long name, but it's essentially a, an energy committee. We also do stuff with jobs and housing. But it's a policy and finance committee, so we get to say what and how much in that same committee, which is fun. Great. Yeah. Um, and basic question that some people might not know, mm -hmm. how long is the legislative session? Yeah, the legislative session operates on a two-year cycle, which is called a biennium. The first year of the biennium is a budget year. That was last year. And the second year of the session is a bonding year, and that's this session. Okay. Helpful. Good. And the Constitution says we can only be in session, I think it's 120 days in a biennium. So we took a few days from this upcoming session because we were in special session last year. So we have to end our session, I think it's May 21st, 4th? Oh, someone should correct me. We, I, will, we will look that up. Yes, we'll look it up. Yeah. Um, what are some of the biggest changes that you think we need to make in our state to, so that it's better for everyone here? Yeah, um, what are some of the changes to make it better for everyone here? I think, so there's an old adage, I'm sure everyone knows that they give it to writers, they say, write what you know. I think that's also been true for legislators. They write what they know. They write from the experience of their own lives. And a lot of the legislators at the Capitol have had really similar experiences and similar lives. And so I think policy has reflected that. It's, it addresses issues for a really small group of people. So one, I think we should start centering the stories of other folks in Minnesota, folks with disabilities, veterans, our young people, uh, and making sure that we're actually listening to what they need and, and addressing those issues there. That would be a really good start. Um, I think the, I would love to see the end of pushing this urban-rural divide because when you talk to folks from the metro or in greater Minnesota, that doesn't exist. That is a narrative that is being pushed for people who find it opportunistic. Yeah, we live in different parts of the state, but people in the metro have cabins in greater Minnesota. People in greater Minnesota went to school in the metro or come to the metro area to go to the mall or go to you know, a dance competition at the XL Center or go to the airport or whatever. And so we're not you know, separated like that. And, and people who push that narrative are really seeking to try to divide us geographically. Um, so stopping that would probably be really nice. Um, I would love to see... Um, I would love to see more transparency in our government and, and more transparency in our democratic process. They say knowledge is power, and I think very often people work very hard to keep knowledge away from folks to maintain their power. Um, so those would, that would be where I would start, but I think just recognizing that it's not about me, it's about we, and, and really getting real about what we're asking folks to do, um, or sacrifice is a really wrong term, but the reality of a policy instead of getting really hyperbolic about a policy, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. More so, like you're saying, what you said before, that we're living the policy. It's very real. Like, right. It's not just right. written on paper. Yeah. It's a real life thing. Yeah. We did a thing called the Minnesota Values Project over the summer and listened to Minnesotans all over the state. Just We asked four questions. Um, what makes you proud to be a Minnesotan? What um, do you like about living here? What could change to make life better for you, your family, and your loved ones? And the things that people said um, didn't really jive with the issues you hear at the Capitol. So very few, if, not, if none, uh, people mentioned taxes. I feel like so often that's pushed as though this is the thing that's keeping people down when it's not. High cost of childcare is keeping people down. High cost of college is keeping people down. Not having, um, you know, having that safety net, having health care that they know that if they get sick tomorrow, they're not sure how they're going to pay those medical bills. That shouldn't be something that's happening. And that's the kind of stuff that we heard. And so what we talk about at the legislature or at the Capitol isn't always what folks are talking about around their kitchen tables. So having more of that translate. I try to be around as many kitchen tables as possible so that I center those stories and then I bring them up when I'm sitting at the decision-making table. Yeah. Right. And I think that definitely underscores the need for people to contact you and yeah. contact the representative yeah. and share those stories. It's so important. I'll tell you, I have the thing called Nights with Neighbors on my website, erinforhouse.com, and it's a place where all of my constituents can go and they can sign up for a night with 
me and then they invite their immediate neighbors, not people they know agree with them, just people who literally live next to them. And we talk about the issues that they want to talk to me about. It's how we share the responsibility of democracy, but it's also how um, my constituents can have access to me. So I encourage any of them to sign up to do that. I had a few signups yesterday, which I'm really excited about. Um, your legislators should be accessible to you like that. And if they're not, you might want to change your legislator. Uh, I find a lot of my colleagues don't like the public part of public servant. So um, challenge your legislators to be accessible to you and, and to really be able to hear your stories, yeah. Well, for being an introvert, that I, I appreciate that. I'm sure your constituents really appreciate yeah, you being yeah. so accessible and really, you know, putting yourself out there like that. Yeah. Um, so you've said this a couple times too, that, you know, we don't have the greatest representation of all diverse types of people in the right. legislature, unfortunately yet. You know, it's making progress every day, um, but how can we do more and be working to uplift the voices of women, of people of color, of yep. kind of like more underrepresented communities that don't always have that very strong, obvious voice at, a, at the table already? Sure. Yeah, I think one is, um, you know, I think folks try to uplift voices of young people, people of color, queer folks when it's convenient. But when it's not convenient and when it feels like, oh, but then my thing isn't a thing, that's when we don't do it. And so don't always take the convenient way when it's inconvenient. Also continue to lift those voices up as well. Um, I also think, you know, listen to us, right? Like, don't just say, okay, thank you for registering your opinion. I'll definitely take that into account and do nothing. Uh, actually do something about it. I know that the things that we're asking for might seem, um, they might seem like, well, we, we've never tried that. I know you've never tried that. That's why we're asking for it. And so I think it's, it's not just doing the placating. It's not just doing the, great, thanks for saying so. Here's our you know, token person at the table. It's actually listening and enacting the things that they have because it's not, it's not arbitrary, these, these suggestions, these ideas, these, these needs and wants. They are very real and we've been shouting about it for a very long time. It's time to listen. Yeah, that's great. Um, so a couple more fun ones. Yay! What is your favorite season and why? Um, fall, layers. Sweaters, scarves, keep jackets, beanies, boots. I love fall. Are you into the pumpkin spice? No. Nope, not that. I don't drink caffeine, so okay. yeah, I don't really, I mean, it smells nice. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, okay, well, that, that's wrapping up most of our questions um, from folks, and I wanted to kind of, before we round out, there's one. Oh, yep, I saw that. Um, but I wanted to, to round out our, our live interview experience here with a rapid fire round. Oh, okay, so let's do it. I'm going to ask you this or that. Pick this or that. Okay. Don't think about, you know, just whatever comes whatever comes to your mind, whatever comes to your heart. Okay. So, all right, ready? Yeah. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Coffee or tea? Tea. State fair or winter carnival? State fair. Beyonce or Rihanna? Beyonce. Excellent. Um, heels or flats? Heels. Skydiving or bungee jumping? Ooh, skydiving. I've done both. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so you're not afraid of heights? Uh, I mean, like a, a, norm, a normal fear of heights, you know, like if I fall, I could die, but um, not irrationally fearful, okay. I guess. Yeah. Um, internet or AC and heating? Oh, you had man. to choose. Internet, but I will freeze to death, I guess, in the winter. I mean, I feel like as a Minnesotan, we can't not have heat, but I just don't know how we could do stuff without the internet. Right. Like, how are you going to post on your Instagram story? How am I going to Wikipedia? <laughs> um, early bird or night owl? Night owl. Yeah. Yeah. We got that. We definitely got that from the from the previous answer. Yeah. Well, that is a wrap for us. And oh, I did find the answer on the end of session. Official is midnight on May twentieth. Twentieth. So that folks know. Neither of the options yeah. that I gave. So we got the, we got the right answer for that yeah. that one. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for tuning in and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Representative, for being yeah. here. We really appreciate this. I'll tell you, if you want to find me more, you can follow me on Twitter, Erin May Quaid, E-R-I-N-M-A-Y-E-Q-U-A-D-E. -E. Same on Facebook, same on Instagram. And uh, you can email me, you can call me, you can DM me, you can text me, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm really excited to do this. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.